All right, today we're going to start a new topic in additive combinatorics. And this is a fairly central topic um, having to do with the structure of set addition. So the main players that we're going to be seeing uh, in this chapter have to do with if you start with a subset of some abelian group, okay, so under addition, um, not necessarily finite, so the abelian group that I want you to keep in mind, the ones that will come up generally are the integers, z mod n, or the finite field model. We're going to be looking at objects such as the sum set, so A plus B, meaning the set of elements that can be written as a sum, where you take one element from A and another from B. Likewise, you can also have A minus B, defined similarly, now taking A minus B. We can iterate this operation. So Ka, so 2a, 3a, 4a, for instance, means I add a to itself k times. Not to be confused with the dilation, which we'll denote by k dot a. So this is notation for multiplying every element of A by the number K. Okay, so given a subset of integers, I can do these operations to the set. And I want to ask, how does the size of the set change when I do these operations? For example, what is the largest or the smallest, so how large or small can A plus A B for a given set size A. Okay, so if I give you, if I allow you to use 10 elements, how can you make A plus A as big as possible and how can you make it as small as possible? Okay, so this is not a hard question. How can you make it as big as possible? So what's the maximum size A plus A can be as a function of A? Well, I'm looking at pairwise sums. So if there are no collisions between different pairwise sums, this is as large as possible. And then it's not hard to see that the maximum possible is the size of A plus 1 choose 2. Okay. Okay. So since at most this many pairs, And it's best possible if all sums are distinct. So for example, in integers, you can take 1, 2, 2 squared, and so on. Okay, so that will give you this bound. The minimum possible is also not too hard. Uh, Okay, we're allowed to work in a general abelian group. So in that case, the minimum could be just the size of A. I mean, it's the size is always at least the size of A. Um, and this is tight if A is a subgroup. If you have a subgroup, then it's closed under addition. So the, side, the set does not expand under addition. In the integers, you don't have any finite subgroups. Um, okay, so if I give you k integers, what's the smallest the sum set can be? 2k minus 1, right? So the example is when you have an arithmetic progression. So okay, integers, the minimum is 2k minus 1. Okay, and it's achieved for an arithmetic progression 
Okay, so let me just give you the one line proof why you always have at least this many elements is if, if A has elements sorted like this, then the following elements are distinct in the sum set. So you start with A plus A and then you move A plus A1 plus A2, A1 plus A3, and so on to A1 plus AK. And then you move the first element forward. Okay, so here you already see 2K plus minus 1 distinct elements in A plus A. Okay, so these are fairly simple examples, fairly simple questions. So now let's get to some more interesting questions, right? which is what can you say about a set if you know that it has small doubling? That if it doesn't expand by very much, what can you tell me about the set? Okay. And for that, let me define the notion of a doubling constant. So the doubling constant of A is defined to be the number which we'll often denote by K. Number obtained by dividing the size of A plus A by the size of A. And we would like to understand, and this is the main question that's addressed uh, in the upcoming lectures, is what is the structure of a set with bounded doubling constant. So for instance, you know, think of k as fixed. Let's say k is 100. If you know a set has doubling constant at most 100, what can you tell me about the structure of the set? So, so that's the main question. Let me show you in a second a few examples of sets that have bounded doubling constant. Right, so it's easy to check that those examples indeed have bounded doubling constant. And what this question amounts to is what is often known as an inverse question. Right, so it's an inverse problem that asks you to describe the in reverse. Right, so it's easy to check in the upcoming examples that all of those examples have bounded doubling constant. And what we want to say is in reverse that if a set has bounded doubling constant, then it must, in some sense, look like one of our examples. It's the harder inverse question. Okay, so let me give you some examples of sets with small doubling constant. One example we already saw earlier is that if you have an arithmetic progression, if you have an arithmetic progression, then the size of A plus A is always two times the size of A minus one. So okay, so the doubling constant is always at most two. Okay. That's pretty small. That's as small as you can get in arithmetic progressions, These are in, the, in the integers. But if you start with an arithmetic progression, and now I take just a subset of the elements of this progression. So if I take AP, and if I cross out a few elements, just a small number of elements from this progression, or even cross out most, but keeping a constant fraction of elements still remaining, I claim that's still a pretty good set. So if, if A can be embedded inside an AP such that the AP has sized no more a constant factor more than that of A, then the size of A plus A is at most 
Right, so we bound it by the size of p plus p, which is at most 2p. So the doubling constant of A is at most 2c. So if you have a set which is at least a tenth fraction of an AP, then your doubling constant is at most 20, okay, bounded. Okay, so this is another class of examples. So it's kind of a modification, some alteration of a arithmetic progression. Another more substantial generalization of APs is that of a two-dimensional arithmetic progression. Right, so you think of an arithmetic progression as well, it's equally spaced points on the line, um, but you can extend this in multiple dimensions. So like a grid. So this is a two-dimensional arithmetic progression, but I still want to work inside the integers. So what we are going to do is project this picture onto the integers. Okay, so that's a two-dimensional arithmetic progression. And um, specifically, we have a set of the form so x naught is starting point plus L1 of x1, L1 times x1 and L2 times x2, where the little l's are integers, non-negative integers up to big L. Okay, so that's a two-dimensional arithmetic progression. So the picture that you can have in mind is on a number line. We can get, f write down first an AP and then a few more points like that so that you can have a two-dimensional arithmetic progression. We say that this set, this two-dimensional arithmetic progression is um, proper if all terms are distinct. Okay. And if that's the case, then I can write A plus A in a very similar format. Right? So A plus A contains elements still of the same form, but now the indices go up to 2L minus 1. So you see that A plus A has size at most 4 times the original set A. Okay. Also easy to see from this blue picture up there, you expand that grid, it goes to almost four times the size. Yes. So the uh, question is, should it be two, ah, uh, two X naught. Hello, what do you mean? Two X naught plus L one X one. Ah, thank you, yeah, so two X naught, thank you. Yeah, two X naught, great. Okay, so. So that's the size. And of course, you can generalize this example also fairly straightforward way to d-dimensional arithmetic progressions. And we call those things generalized arithmetic progressions. So a generalized arithmetic progression which we will abbreviate by the letters GAP, is sort of a set of numbers of the form as above, except now you have d different directions and the indices are also straightforward generalizations of what was earlier. Okay, so this is 
notion of a generalized arithmetic progression. So think of a projection of a d-dimensional grid onto the integers. And for GAPs, we say that it's proper if all the terms are distinct we call D the dimension of the GAP. And for a GAP, whether it's proper or not, we call the size to be the product of the lengths. Right. Um, and this is potentially larger, so this is larger than the number of distinct elements if it's not proper. So when I refer to the size of a GAP, so I view the GAP more than just as a set, but also with the data of the initial point and the directions, if I talk about the size, I'm always referring to this quantity over here. Okay. Great. So you see, if you take a GAP, or a fraction of a GAP, then as with earlier examples, you have small doubling. Um, so if P is a proper GAP, um, then okay, of dimension D, then P plus P is at most 2 raised to the power D times the size of P. And furthermore, if A is an arbitrary subset of P, um, and such that A has size, uh, such that the P, the GAP, has size at most a constant fraction bigger than that of A, then A has small doubling as well. So all of these are examples of constructions of sets where for some fixed constant, the doubling constant, we can find a family of sets with doubling constant bounded by that number. Okay, and the natural question now is, are these all the examples? Okay, so have we missed some important family of constructions not covered by any of these examples? And so that's the kind of inverse question I was referring to earlier. So all of these examples, easy to check that they indeed have small doubling constant. Can you, do go, in, can you go in reverse? And so can you ask the inverse question, if a set has small doubling constant, must it look like, in some sense, one of these sets? It turns out this is not such an easy problem. And there is a central result in additive combinatorics known as Freiman's theorem, which gives a positive answer to that question. So Freiman's theorem is now considered a central result in additive combinatorics, and it completely describes, in some sense, the sets that have small doubling. And let me sit, write down the statement. So if A is a subset of Z and has bounded doubling, then A is contained in a GAP of bounded dimension and size bounded by some constant times the size of the set. This is a really important result in additive combinatorics. And so it, the title of this chapter, Structural Set Addition, you know, Freiman's theorem tells us something about the structure of a set with small doubling. 
the next few lectures are going to be occupied with proving this theorem. So this theorem will have, um, you know, its proof is involved, and probably the most involved proof that we have in this course. And the proof will take you know, the next several lectures. And we'll see a lot of different ingredients, a lot of really nice tools. Um, Fourier analysis will come up at some point, but also other tools like the geometry of numbers um, and also some more classical additive combinatorics ideas. Uh, but before starting on the proof, I want to offer a few remarks and historical remarks, uh, just give you some more context about Feynman's theorem. But first, a few mathematical comments. Um, in the conclusion of Feynman's theorem, I didn't mention properness. And that's mostly a matter of convenience. So you can, in fact, make the conclusion proper as well at the cost of increasing the, the number somewhat, but still you know, constants depending only on k. Can, uh, can, can guarantee properness as well. So there's an extra step involved which we'll not cover. Um, it's, it's not entirely trivial, but it's also not too hard. Freiman's original proof, um, so okay, it's named after Freiman, so he proved it in the 60s, um, but at that time the proof was considered rather obscure. It actually did not get the attention and the recognition that it deserved until much later. So this was kind of a forgotten result, a forgotten proof for a very long time. Until quite a bit later when Rusha, Rusha's name will come up many times in this chapter, Rusha came and gave a different proof of Freiman's theorem and significantly cleaned up the proof and offered many new ideas. So much of what we'll see today are results that we now attribute to Rusha and the theorem sometimes is also called the Freiman-Rusha theorem. So it's, okay. But this result was really brought into um, the, you know, brought as a highlight of com additive combinatorics in the work of Gowers when he proved, gave his new proof of Semmerides theorem, giving much better bounds. So he had to use quite a bit of um, you know, serious additive combinatorics. And many of the ideas that went into Gowers' proof of Semmerides theorem came from this line of work, Freiman and Ruzsa. And, so, and, and their work was again brought into prominence as a result of you know, Gower's Fields Medal winning work on Semmerides theorem. Okay, so this is some of, the, some of the history and now Freiman's theorem is considered a central result in the area. And you can see it's, it's a beautiful result and it's also quite a deep result. Let me mention a few things about bounds. Right? So what do we know about this d of k and f of k. But first, an example. So if the set A is dissociated in the sense of having no um, arithmetic structure, like no coincidental um, sums colliding, so for example, if A is of this form, then you see that, well, so we saw the size of A plus A, right, so it's A plus one choose two. So in this case, the doubling constant is the size of A plus one divided by two. So okay, so roughly the same order as the size of A. Um, but what do you need to take in Feynman's theorem for D and for F? So how can I embed this A in a generalized arithmetic progression? See, it's a, it's, there's not a great way to do it. So I want to keep the size small. It's not a great way to do it. So one way to do it is to use one direction for each of these elements. So contained in GAP. Now, of course, there's always a trade-off between dimension and size, but usually not a great, I mean, it's not such an important trade-off. So, but certainly it's contained in the GAP of dimension size of a minus one and size two to the size of a minus one by thinking about a as a cube. And you should convince yourself that you basically cannot do much better. So 
So the best possible bound that we can hope to prove is of the form D being at most linear in K and F being at most exponential in K. Okay, so you so you see already the bounds, they you have to lose some things. Yes. Okay, great. So that's a great question. So why can we just make dimension one and have the entire thing be as part of a single linear arithmetic progression? So you can do that. But then I can cook up other examples where I blow up this cube. Okay, so I ask you to think about how to do that. So if you can try to blow up this cube so that you really do need the dimension to uh, not be constant. Okay, so exercise. So the best result is it's not quite this claim. So this is still open. So the best result so far is due to Tom Sanders, so whose name came up earlier as he has basically the best bound on Roth's theorem. And you know, many of these results are all related to each other. So, so it's, it's okay. So Sanders has, um, uh, so he showed that Freiman's theorem is true with D being, okay, so basically K, but you lose a polylog factor. I think the big O is maybe three or four or something like that, so not, not substantial. And then F of K is also basically exponential, but you lose a polylog factor in the exponent. Just a minor note about how to read this notation. So, I mean, it's written slightly sloppily as log k raised to big O of one. You should think k as constant, but somewhat big, because if k were two, this notation actually doesn't make sense. Okay, so just, so you should think of k as at least you know, three when you read that notation. All right, so we will prove Freiman's theorem. Uh, we will not have to show this bound. We will show a worse bound. Actually, will be basically exponentially worse, but it will be a constant, right? So it will be just a function of k. Um, and that will take us the next several lectures. Okay, so we'll begin by developing some tools that are, I think, all interesting individually, and they can all be used for other things. Um, so we'll develop some tools that will help us show, uh, eventually lead us to Freiman's theorem. And I'll try to structure this proof in such a way that there are several uh, goalposts that are also interesting on its own. And in particular, just as what we did with Ross theorem, we'll begin by proving a finite field analog of Freiman's theorem. Okay, so what does that, what would that mean? A finite field analog. So what would a problem like this mean in F2 to the M? So in F2 to the n, okay, so this is a finite field analog. If A plus A is small, okay, so, okay, so I'm trying to ask an inverse question. Um, but what are examples of sets in F2 to the n that have small doubling? Two to the end, so you can take the entire space. Any other examples have small doubling? Good. Yeah, exactly. I can take a subspace. Right? So a subspace well, it doesn't grow. So A plus A is the same as A. All right. So and also as before, you can take a subset of a subspace. Okay. So then the analog of Freiman's theorem will say that then A is contained in a subspace of size at most a constant times the size of A. 
Okay, so this is the analog of Freiman's theorem in F2. And so we'll see, okay, so this will be much easier than the general result about Freiman's theorem, but it will involve a subset of the tools, and we'll see this theorem first. Okay, so we'll prove that next lecture. Um, of course, you know, this is much easier in many ways because here, unlike before, I don't even have to think about what subspace to take. I can just take the subspace generated by the elements of A. All right. Any questions so far? Yes. Is the f of k here still exponential in k? Okay, so the question is, is the f of k here still exponential in k? Um, so the answer is yes. And the construction is if you take A to be a basis. Okay, so let's start with some techniques and some proofs. So in this chapter, many things are named after Ruzsa. And at some point, it became slightly confusing which ones are not named after Ruzsa. Uh, but the first thing will be named after Ruzsa. So it's a Ruzsa triangle inequality. All right. The Ruzsa triangle inequality tells us that if A, B, and C, so unless otherwise I tell you so, and I'll, I'll try to remind you each time, but basically we're always going to be looking at finite sets in an arbitrary abelian group. Okay, always written under addition. Then one has the inequality on their sizes of different sets. Okay, the size of A times the size of B minus C is upper bounded by the size of A minus B times the size of A minus C. Okay, so that's the Ruzsa triangle inequality. Let me show you the proof. We will construct an injection from A cross B minus C to A minus B cross A minus C. Of course, if you can exhibit such an injection, then you prove the desired inequality. To obtain this injection, we start with an element a comma d. And for this a comma d, okay, so for each d, let me pick. Um, so if d is an element of b minus c, let us pick arbitrarily, but stick with those choices, a, um, a b of d in the set B and a C of D in the set C such that D equals to B of D minus C of D. So because D is in the set B minus C, it can be represented as a difference from one element from each set. They may be represented in many ways, but from the start, you pick a way to represent it and you stick with that choice. And you label that the function B of D and C of D. Now I map a comma d to the element a minus b of d and a minus c of d. Okay, so this is a map. I want to show that it is injective. Why is it injective? Well, to show something's injective, I just need to show that I can recover where I came from if I tell you the, the image. Right? So I can recover A and D from these two numbers. So if, let me start with new board. Uh, okay, so while you race, you can think about how you can recover A and D from the image elements. Right. 
So if the image, okay, so I label that map phi. Um, so, okay, so that's that's phi up there. So if the image is given, then I can recover. Okay, so how can we recover the element D? Okay, so you subtract these two numbers. So D is Y minus X. And once you recover D, yeah, you can also then take a look at the first element and you can recover A. Okay, so now you know D, I can now recover A. Okay, so then this is, you can check, this is an injection, and that proves the Ruja triangle inequality. Okay, so it's, it's short, but it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. Um, okay, so why is this called Ruja's triangle inequality? Where's the triangle in this? Uh, the reason that it's given that name is that you can write the inequality as follows. Suppose we use rho a comma b to denote this quantity obtained by taking the log of the size of a minus b divided by the square root of the product of their individual sizes, then the inequality says that the rho of b comma c is at most rho of a comma b plus rho of a comma c, which looks like a triangle inequality. Okay, so that's why it's called Ruja's triangle inequality. Because this is, you know, don't take it too seriously because this is not a distance. So this is, uh, so rho of a comma a is not equal to zero. Um, okay, so, but certainly it has the form of a triangle inequality, hence the name. How should you think of Ruja's triangle inequality? Okay, so in this chapter, there's going to be a lot of symbol pushing around, and it's easy to get lost and buried in all of these symbols. And I want to um, tell you about how you might think about, you know, what's, what's the point of Ruja's triangle inequality? How would you use it? And the idea is that if you have a set with small doubling, we want to use Ruja's triangle inequality and other tools to control its further doublings. Um, so in particular, if, okay, so as a, so let's say applications, so suppose you knew that 2a minus 2a <coughs> is size at most k times a. Okay, so this is a stronger hypothesis than just a has small doublings. Even if you iterate it several times, you still um, have size at most constant times a. I would like to start from this hypothesis and control further iterations, further some sets of a. And Ruja's triangle inequality allows us to do it because by the triangle inequality, so Ruja triangle inequality, setting b and c to be 2a minus a, we find that 3a minus 3a is at most 2a minus 2a squared over a, the size of a. Okay, so plug it in, this is what you get. So if the size of 2a plus 2a is at most k times the size of a, then the size of 3a times 3a is, uh, you know, blows up a factor at most k squared. So it controls further doublings. And of course, we can iterate. Right? Iterate, if we now set b and c to be 3a minus 2a, then what we get is 5a minus 5a is at most the size of 3a minus 3a squared divided by the size of a. And so now you have a bound, which is k to the 4 times a. And you can continue. Right? You can continue. So starting with, okay, so this is all consequence of Ruja triangle. So starting with this hypothesis, now I get to control 
all the further doublings, uh, the further sum set iterations. I call them doublings, but you know, they're no longer doubles, but further sum sets. But this is a stronger hypothesis than the one that we will start with in Freiman's theorem. Because if you have that, then this 2a minus 2a is at least as large as the size of 2a. So can we start with just doubling constant and then obtain bounds on the iterations? Okay, so it turns out you can. But it will require uh, another theorem. So this theorem is called Plinniker's inequality. Um, but actually, these days in literature, it's often referred to as plinniker russia inequality. So Plinniker initially proved it, but nobody understood his proof, and Ruzia gave a better proof. And actually, recently, there was an even better proof, and that's the one I will show you. plinniker russia inequality tells us that if a is a subset of some abelian group. And has doubling constant at most k. Then for all non-negative integers m and n, the size of ma minus Na is at most k to the m plus n times the size of a. So if you have bounded doubling, then the further iterations, the further sum set iterations, are also controlled in size. I want you to think of polynomial transformations in k as negligible. Okay, so don't worry about that. We're raising things, things in here. k is constant. You should think of m and n as constant. So I'm changing k to some other constant. In fact, I'm only changing it by a polynomial. So this is like almost no change at all. Okay. Okay, so this is tricky. Okay, so we'll do it after a short break. All right, let's prove Plinniker's inequality. That's plinniker ruja inequality. So the history of Plinniker's inequality is has some similarities with Freiman's theorem. So Plinniker initially proved it, but his proof was hard to understand and was sort of left not understood for a long time until um, others like Bilou and Ruja came in and really simplified the proof. But even then, um, the proof was not so easy. And if I were teaching this course about 10 years ago, I would have just skipped this proof. Maybe sketch some ideas, but I would have skipped the proof. And the proof actually, and this, it's a beautiful proof, but use some you know, serious graph theory. Use this Menger's theorem about flows. You construct some graph, and then you try to understand its flows. Uh, it's very pretty stuff, and I do encourage you to uh, look it up. Um, and then about eight years ago, Petritus found a proof. Um, so proof by Patridis, um, who was a PhD student at Tim Gowers at the time, and that was surprisingly short and beautiful and kind of surprised everyone that such a short proof exists, given that this theorem sat in that state for such a long time. And it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty central step in the proof of Freiman's theorem. We'll prove Pernicaruja uh, via a slightly more general statement. Okay, so you see it generalizes the earlier statement, instead of having one set, it will be convenient to have two different sets. So let A and B be subsets of some abelian group, as usual. If size of A plus B is at most K times the size of A, then M B minus N B has size at most K to the M plus N times the size of A for all non-negative integers M and N. 
Okay, so instead of having one set, I have two sets, A and B. Because then you derive the earlier statement setting A and B to equal. Okay, so we'll prove this more general statement. The proof uses a key lemma. And the key lemma says that if a set, a subset X of A is non-empty, and okay, so is, if this is the is if X is a non-empty subset of A that minimizes the ratio x plus b divided by the size of x. And let k prime be this ratio, this minimum ratio. Then so the conclusion says that x plus b plus c has size at most k prime times the size of x plus c for all sets c. Okay, so that's the statement. I'll explain how you should think about this statement. These ratios, which you see in both hypotheses, how you should think about them is that there's this graph. Let's say it's a group, a bipartite graph with the group elements on both sides. And the graph has edges, the bipartite graph, where the edges are each, from each vertex, I draw an edge for each element of B. So I expand by B. So if you have this graph and you start with some a on the left, then its neighbors on the right will be A plus B. And those ratios up there are the expansion ratios. So quantities like this, they are expansion ratios. You start with some set on the left, and see by what fraction does it expand if you look at the neighborhood. So let's read the statement of the key lemma. It says if you have a set X, and okay, so I have a set A, and I'm choosing a subset of A that minimizes the expansion ratio. So choose a non-empty subset that minimizes the expansion ratio. And this minimum expansion ratio is K prime then okay, so x minimizes expansion ratio and expansion ratio is k prime, then x plus c also has <coughs> expansion ratio at most k prime as well. Okay, so that's the statement. I mentioned earlier that the previous proofs of this theorem went through some graph theory, uh, and uh, you know, Menger's theorem, that type of graph theory, uh, okay, you can kind of see where it might come in. Okay, we're not gonna do that, we're gonna stick with additive combinatorics. We're gonna stick with some, yeah, so playing with sums, playing with additive combinatorics. Uh, so let's see how we can prove the statement up there, so using the key lemma. So assuming key lemma, So let's prove the statement, uh, the theorem up there. So take a non-empty subset X of A, uh, so the X subset of A that, minimizing, uh, that minimizes the ratio X plus B divided by X. And let k 
k prime be this minimum ratio. Um, note that k prime is at most k, right? because if you plug in x equals to k, you get, if you plug in x equals to a, you get k, but I'm choosing x to be possibly even lower, so k prime is at most k. Okay, so now applying the lemma, so applying the key lemma with c equals to b, we find that x plus 2b, so c plug in b, x plus 2b has size at most k times size of x plus b, but the size of x plus b is at most k times the size of a. So we get k squared, uh, so k times the size of x, at most k squared x. Okay, so we're already in good shape. So if you double, if you iterate expansion twice, so imagine there's several chains of these bipartite graphs. If you iterate this expansion twice, you still do not blow up by too much. So we can iterate further. So apply lemma with c being now 2b, and then later 3b, and so on. So you find that x plus nb has size at most k raised to power n times the size of x for all non-negative integers n. What do we want to control? Okay, so we want to prove a bound on the size of mb minus nb. Take a look at the statement of Ruja triangle inequality. Applying Ruja triangle inequality, we find that if we want to control mb minus nd, we can upper bound it by x plus mb, x plus nd divided by the size of x. Because each of these two factors in the numerator are small expansions of x, now we can upper bound the whole expression by k to the m plus n times the size of x. And because x is a subset of a, we can do one more upper bound and obtain the bound that we are looking for. Okay, so that proves the key lemma. Okay, that, uh, that proves the theorem assuming the key lemma. Thank you. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, so that proves the theorem assuming the key lemma. So now we need to prove the key lemma. Great. We need to prove the key lemma. And so Petrita's proof of the key lemma is it's quite surprising in that it uses induction. And basically, we have not used induction in this course ever since the first or maybe the second lecture. And for good reason, right? So everything in this course is fairly analytic. It's, you know, you have these rough bounds and, you know, putting in one extra vertex often doesn't really help. Um, okay, so, so here we're going to use induction on the size of C. Uh, so induction on the size of C. Okay, I just want to emphasize again that the use of induction here was surprising. Right. So the base case, always check the base case. Um, when C is 1, then plus C is a translation. Okay, so it shifts the set over. 
and um, okay, sorry. So you can see that if you do plus c and minus one, you raise the plus c, and the conclusion uh, follows basically from the hypothesis. Right? So in this case, x plus b plus c is equal to x plus b, which is at most k prime times the size of x by definition of, um, okay, so it's actually it's equal to the size of k, uh, anyway. So, okay, so the induction, the, the base case is easy. Now we do the induction step. Uh, so let's assume that the size of C is bigger than one and C is C prime plus an additional element which we'll call gamma. So let's see this expression X plus B plus C. By separating it according to if, it came, if its contribution came from C prime or not. The contributions that came from C prime, I can write it like that. And then there are other contributions, namely those that came from this extra element. Okay. But I may have some redundancies in doing this. So I may have some redundancies coming from the fact that some of the elements in this set might have already appeared earlier. So let me take out those elements. By taking out elements where it's already appeared earlier. So this means I'm looking at the set Z being elements of x such that x plus b plus gamma is already a subset of x plus b plus c prime. Okay, so the stuff in yellow I can safely discard because it had already appeared earlier. Um, so because of the definition of Z, we see that Z plus B plus gamma appears in X plus B plus C prime. So, so that, so that union is valid. Now, Z is a subset of X. So the expansion ratio for z is at least k prime because we chose x to minimize this expansion ratio. We would like to understand how big is x plus b plus c. So let's evaluate the cardinality of that uh, expression up there. The cardinality, I can upper bound by the union of these uh, sum of the sizes of the components. Okay, so up there, so I do a union bound on that expression up there. And now you see Z is a subset of X, so I can split this expression up even further. Now let's use the induction hypothesis. Okay, so we have some expression involving x 
plus b plus c prime. So now we apply induction hypothesis over here to this expression that has plus c prime. And we obtain an upper bound, which is k prime x plus c prime. And the two expressions on the right, well, one of them here is by definition coming from the expansion ratio of x. And then the other, we gave a bound just now. Okay, so, so. So we're almost there. So we are trying to upper bound the size of this quantity. So we decompose it into uh, pieces according to its contribution coming from this extra element, and we analyze these pieces individually. But now I want to understand the right-hand side. Okay, so it's x plus c. So let's try to understand the right-hand side. See, the x plus c, I can likewise write it as earlier by decomposing it into contributions from c prime and those from the extra element. And as earlier, we can take out contributions that were already appearing earlier which we now will call W plus gamma, where W is the set of elements in X such that X plus gamma is already contained in X plus C prime. So this part was already included earlier. We don't need to include it anymore. couple of ob observations that were different from earlier. Now, this union, I claim, is a disjoint union. Okay, so this union is a disjoint union. So there's actually no more overlaps. And furthermore, W is contained in the set Z from earlier. Any questions? All right. Therefore, the size of x plus c is equal to, because this is a disjoint union, x plus c prime plus the size of x minus the size of w. Right. And which is, so W, because W is contained in Z, there's X plus C prime plus the size of X minus the size of Z. Okay, now you compare these two expressions, and that proves the key lemma. That's it. Yep. Can you explain one more time why it's a disjoint union? Okay, great. So why is this a disjoint union? Now, I have this set here. Okay, so I'm looking at this x plus gamma, and I'm taking, okay, so think about, let's say, gamma equals to zero. Okay, so let's, in a way, translate. Think about if gamma equals to zero. So I include x, but if some element of x was already here, I take it out. Right, so, so here is x plus c prime, and let's say this set is x. This w then would there be their intersection. Okay, so, I, so now 
x minus w is just this set, or so this join union. So the point, so here you're adding single elements, where there you're adding some sets, so you cannot necessarily take out whole uh, you know, partition necessarily, but here it's okay. Right? It's tricky. <laughs> yeah, it's tricky. And you know, this took a long time for people to find. It was found uh, about eight years ago. And um, yeah, it was surprising that when this proof was, was discovered, People did not expect that this proof existed. Uh, and it's also tricky to get right. <laughs> so the details, I do it slowly, but the execution, like the order you take the minimalities is, is important. It's easy to mess up this proof. Okay, any questions? Let me show you, just as an aside, an application of this key lemma. So earlier we saw Ruja's triangle inequality. And you might wonder, what if you replace the minus signs in the theorem by plus signs? I mean, if you place the right-hand side, the two pluses by minuses, the same proof works. But if you replace all the minus signs by plus signs, see, the proof doesn't work anymore. Okay, so just give yourself a moment to convince yourself that if you just place all the minus signs by plus signs, it doesn't work anymore, but it's still true. Okay, so, so this is more of an aside. We will not use it, but it's, it's nice. It's fun. So we have the inequality A, B plus C is bounded by A plus B, A plus C. So hopefully you've convinced yourself that if you follow our notes with the previous proof, you're, you're not going to get it. You're not going to prove this this way. Okay. It's still true, so how can we prove it? So we're going to use the key lemma. So, uh, first, the statement is trivial if A is empty. So let's assume that's not the case. Let X be a subset of A that minimizes the expression or the expansion ratio x plus b divided by x as in the key lemma. Okay. Um, so, okay, so let k denote the quantity a plus b over a, so the expansion ratio for a, and k prime be the expansion ratio for x. Okay, so the same quantities came up earlier. Um, k prime is at most that of k because of our choice of x. So the key lemma gives that x a, a b plus c you know, it's, it's really amazing what's happening. It seems like we're just going to throw in some extra stuff. Okay, so I'm going to upper bound it by x plus b plus c. It's going to throw in some extra stuff. And then by the lemma, I can upper bound this expression by k prime times sides of x plus c. Okay, so that's what the lemma gives you. And because x is a subset of a, we can upper bound it by the size of a plus c. Okay? And now k prime is at most the size of k. k prime is at most k. So you have that. But now look at what the definition of k is. So, so that's how you can prove this uh, harder version of Ruja's triangle inequality. Yes, question. Uh, are there equality cases for this? Right, question. Are there cases for this? Yeah, so I mean, if you're in a subgroup, then all things are equal. 
all the if A, B, and C are all the same subgroup of some finite abelian group. Great, yeah, so question is what if you're working in integers? Um, that's a good question. I mean, you can certainly get expansion ratio of two if you have, no, okay. Um, right, yeah, so that's a good question. Can you get equality cases? If you set A, B, and C to be um, sets of very different sizes, uh, APs are very different. Yes. Yeah, so you take A to be a single element set, then it could be that B plus C is the same as the size of B times the size of C if B and C have no additive interactions. Right. Yeah. Are there other known proofs of this? Are or small? Okay, are there other known proofs of this? I don't know. I'm not aware of other proofs. Yeah, it would be nice to find a different proof. More questions? Yep. How did he come up with this? You know, Patridas did a very long PhD. He uh, spent, I think, seven or eight years in his PhD, and he eventually came up with this proof. So he must have thought a lot about this problem. But the earlier proofs are still nice. The earlier proofs, I think, they are look worth looking at. They are looking at expansion ratios in graphs. So you take a sequence of graphs, multi-party graphs, and you think about expansion, and you think about flows. It's, again, not easy at all, but maybe more motivated if you're used to think about expansions and flows in graphs. And this one really distills the core ideas of that proof, uh, but now it looks you know, something you can teach in half a lecture, whereas you know, before this proof came about, I could have taught the proof, but most likely I would have just skipped it. Okay. All right. Just give you um, a s sense of what's coming up ahead. So going forward, um, the first thing we'll do in the next lecture is we'll show, we'll see the proof of the Freiman, Freiman's theorem in the finite field setting. Right. So we have two to the n. Uh, so we've, there's one more thing, one more very quick lemma called the covering lemma, Buja covering lemma, that I'll tell you. And then once we have that, then we can prove Freiman's theorem in the finite field setting. But then moving on to the integers, we'll need to understand how to think about the integers. Well, if you start with a subset of integers, they could, um, you know, even if you have a small number of elements, they could be spread out really all over the place. But because you only care about the additive structure within the integers, you can try to model that very spread out set of integers to something that is very compact. So there's something called the modeling lemma, the Lucia's modeling lemma, uh, that we'll see next time. And that will play a pretty important role. Now, before finishing off, I also want to mention that you know, Freiman in his work, so he had this result and he also wrote a book, um, I think called uh, the structural theory of set addition or something like that, that emphasized this connection. Uh, he tried to draw this analogy uh, sort of comparing additive combinatorics to um, sort of geometry in the sense of Klein, where in order to understand sets, you don't think about sets, you think about maps between sets, which was kind of an obscure idea at the time. We'll see next lecture that this actually is a very powerful, it's a very influential idea to really think about sets of integers under transformations that only preserve their additive structure. Okay, so we'll see this next time.